Dimmer with Drusy, and tonight's seminar we're going to be doing or looking at health, nutrition, exercise, and weight loss. The outcomes of tonight's seminar are how nutrition affects weight loss, how exercise affects weight loss, understanding energy and metabolism, why diets don't work, how a glycemic index or the basis of glycemic index and the impact it has on our health and nutrition, tips to lose weight and maintain weight loss, types of food to help us maintain our weight and understanding the eating and behaviour relationship. Obesity is becoming a major problem in the world that we live in today. It is causing a number of preventable illnesses and is having a massive impact in the healthcare budget. Countries in the Western world like America, Australia, the UK and many other Western countries are leading the way in high levels of obesity. And the problem has got worse over the last 10, 15, 20 years and it looks like it's going to get even more worse in time to come along. And one of the reasons for that is because as a society we're eating more and more fast food. Food that's high in calories which has very low nutritional values. We're going to talk more about that as we go along throughout the seminar. Have you been in that situation before yourself, or you might know someone who's been in that situation before where you don't know what to do, you don't know who to turn to, who to talk to, everyone's got different ideas, you've got different diets, people say eat one thing, people say something else, and you're not quite sure what to do. What I'm going to do tonight is to keep it very basic and keep it very easy to understand. Losing weight is quite simple. If we consume the same amount of calories then we burn, then we're going to stay the same weight. If we intake more calories than we burn, we're going to put weight on. If we burn more calories than we consume, we're going to lose weight. So it's important to understand and be aware of that. The mathematical equation to losing weight is quite simple really, yet in saying that it's a little bit like a paradox. It's not quite as easy as that because as human beings we're governed by our emotions and for our emotions, sometimes we're driven to eat, and also our association with different types of foods is preventing us sometimes from eating healthfully or eating what we should be eating to lose weight and stay in shape. Well, what is a calorie? You might be wondering. A calorie, to keep it simple, is a unit of energy. The human body needs calories or energy to survive. But we're going to talk a little bit more about calories and the impact in weight loss for seminar. But let's just sort of identify how much energy different types of uh, food might have, which we're going to talk about for the seminar. One gram of carbohydrate has four calories. One gram of protein has four calories, and one gram of fat has nine calories. Hence, while we say we should cut down on fat, or consider cutting down on fat to lose weight, because it has a high amount of energy. Yet that said, we're going to talk for the seminar of how fat is important. Like all things, it's about moderation. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I've just joined a gym. I've got a personal trainer. I can burn it off. I'll go out running every night and I'll burn it off, which is fine. Exercise does contribute towards losing weight, yet it contributes fairly minimally. Have you seen the sort of person who joins a gym and says, well, actually, you know what? I can burn that pint off. I can burn that uh, hamburger off. I can burn that fish and chips off. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. The reason being is that 3,500 calories is equivalent to one pound of fat. 860 calories is the approximate value for a cheeseburger. Now, the next time you're driving home after the gym, you're driving along after you've gone to the gym, you think I'm going to go through that drive through and, and, and raid um, McDonald's, bear that in mind that a moderate run on the treadmill burns about two to three hundred calories. Well, you might be saying, well, that's four hours to burn off a cheeseburger. Are you going to stop buying and get that cheeseburger? <laughs> Probably not. So that's 15 to 20 hours to burn off a pound of fat. It's incredible, isn't it? So whilst this slice is important, has a lot of health benefits we're going to sort of touch on shortly, it is important to know that if we're depending on exercise to lose weight, we are going to cause ourselves a lot of problems because the relationship between burning calories and exercise is fairly minimal. So why exercise, you might be saying? What's the point of exercising? Why do I join that gym? Why do I walk around the block every night? Why do I go for these nice, lovely summer, summer evening walks? 
and all the like. Well, exercise does contribute towards losing weight. It does burn calories. It can increase your metabolism. But also, bearing in mind, you get a better quality of life. You exercise, you feel better. You can go out there, play football with your grandkids, with your children. It's good for your mind. It produces chemicals in the brain, like endorphins, that promote well-being. We're less likely to get a serious illness if we combine it with a healthy lifestyle. Statistics have shown that exercise can go a long way to preventing, or well, helping to prevent certain illnesses and ailments. It does contribute, like I said earlier, to burning calories, but I think the key is to do it as you enjoy it. Now think about it this way, where exercise is concerned. Average heart rate is 60 to 90 beats per minute, okay? Now, if your heart rate was 90 beats per minute, and you were to do, say, 30 minutes walk every other night, or maybe a light jog, you could probably bring your heart rate down by 10, 20 beats per minute in time. Now, you might think that's not a great deal. What's 10, 10 20 beats per minute less on my heart rate? And think about it, how many minutes in a day? That's about 10,000 10, beats less strain in your heart by going out there doing four or five cardiovascular sessions a week, even three or four. So exercise is important for our health, for our well-being. It can contribute towards losing weight. Yet if we're depending on exercise alone to lose weight, then we're selling ourselves short, really. So what I want you to do now is write a list of activities you enjoy. Because exercise shouldn't be boring, it shouldn't be tedious. I couldn't think of anything more boring than running on the treadmill, in the gym, just looking at, you know, forward. I think exercise should be enjoyed. I love going for country walks. I think going for country walk is phenomenal. Getting out there, getting the fresh air, clearing your head. Write a list of activities that you really enjoy doing. Because if you make it a chore, you're less likely to do it. There are things that you like to do. Badminton, you might want to play football with your grandkids. You might want to go out there and, and play a sport. You might do dancing, salsa dancing. There's some things you can do Exercise doesn't have to be tedious in a gym, it can be anything you want it to be. And most importantly, make it enjoyable. Write a list of activities that you enjoy. And if you're a nutritionist or a coach, then you can get your clients to write down things they enjoy doing. Because I think the key thing is also, very in mind, if we're exercising, we're out there, we're enjoying ourselves, we're less likely to eat food anyway. So if you're out there, you're going for a country walk, you might have a glass of water, you might have some water with lemon in it, get some fresh air or you play some sport, you're less likely to eat and also the endorphins. So think about it. Once you've finished exercise, think about your appetite. Generally, your appetite isn't that great, is it really? I think the key is exercise, if nothing else, it promotes a good level of well-being as well. So write things that you really enjoy doing. It's a lifestyle change. That's the most important thing where weight loss is concerned. It's changing our lifestyle to being sedentary, like a lot of people are in the world that we're living today, to be more active, to eating better, to eating calories that have more nutritional values. That's a general lifestyle change. To lose weight, nutrition is the key. To lose and, main, to lose and maintain weight, nutrition, as I said earlier in the seminar, is key. Burn more calories to consume, we're going to lose weight. The average male needs around about two to 3,000 calories per day. Depends on their activity level, what they're doing, what their job is, uh, whether they play sport. A number of factors uh, take, take into consideration, but the average female burns around 2,000. Same again, that's just a very average estimation of how many calories you burn per day at rest, or how many we need per day, I should say, um, without doing uh, a, a great deal. But obviously you can add to that. If you're very active or you, you've got a very uh, manual labour job or you do a lot of exercise, then that might be a little bit different with different people. But bearing in mind, that's just a rough estimate. Why diets don't work? Well, diets don't work because they're not sustainable. They're not a lifestyle change. I couldn't think of anything more boring than to stick to a regime every day. Eventually, you're going to break mentally. You're going to think, well, what's the point? You've got to get a balance in life. And I truly believe it's about a lifestyle change. How many people do you know you may have been on yourself a diet and you've given up? You get up and you read one fad and another fad and who's doing this, who's doing that. How sustainable really is it? How sustainable is depriving yourself of things that you do enjoy? Because food has become a social thing as well, isn't it? You might enjoy to eat socially. The key is in moderation. And I always say the 80-20 rule. 
80% of the time, eat well, and 20% of the time, go out there and treat yourself. Because life is short, you'll go out there and enjoy yourself. But I wouldn't see it so much as a diet, because a diet is almost like deprivation, punishing yourself. You can't have this, you can't have that. Not really much point in doing that, is it? Let's look at our metabolic rate. Okay, our metabolic rate is how many calories we burn at rest. Without doing anything throughout the day, how many calories we burn at rest. A very rough way to estimate is to multiply your body weight in pounds by 11. For example, if you weigh 200 pounds, you'd multiply that by 11, and that would be 2,200 pounds that you would burn at rest. A body that consumes 2,500 calories per day and burns 2,500 calories per day will stay the same weight. We burn calories for basic energy needs, basic bodily functions. 60-75% of the energy we burn is for basic bodily functions. Food processing, digestion, is about 10% and activity is pretty much the rest. So, nutrition is the key. Having a variable diet, which is a lot of vegetables and fruit as well, and, and we look for proteins too, we can eat uh, fish and we can eat certain types of meat, we can eat any type of meat you, you want to eat really. Yet, what I would suggest too is to make sure, if you are going to eat meat, to make sure that the meat is organic. Let's look at good fats and bad fats. Some fat is good for us and there's other fat that's not quite good for us, which is important to know. Fat, on a whole, is very high in energy. So whether it's good or bad, it is high in energy. And if you eat excessive fat, whatever it is, it's going to cause you to gain weight. Albeit, one thing to bear in mind, there's two types of main fats found in food. The good one, unsaturated, the bad one is saturated. Yet in saying that, within reason, there are some fats that are unsaturated that aren't great for us, and there are some fats that are saturated that are okay for us as well. But we'll look at that as we go along. Solid fats and added processed sugars add calories to food but few or no nutrients. And that's pretty much what you get in your takeaways, your fast foods, and if you eat consistently fast foods and takeaways and all that sort of food, you're going to be probably yourself with a lot of nutrients and you're going to always be hungry all the time. But we're going to look at that as we go along for the seminar. There are empty calories. Empty calories are known as discretionary calories, those who consume with little or no nutritional values. A bit like that takeaway, that have no dietary fibre, amino acids, antioxidants, dietary or, or, or minerals. Nothing at all. So they're not doing us any good where our weight is concerned, but also our health as well. Good fats. So good fats, unsaturated, non-unsaturated fats, olive oil, almonds, cashews, peanuts, avocados, polyunsaturated fats, salmon, mackerel, herrings, Omega freeze, flaxseed oil. Good fats and studies have shown that eating good fats, rich in monounsaturated fats, improves blood cholesterol levels. They can also decrease your risk of heart disease as well. Unsaturated fats are called good fats because they improve blood cholesterol, stabilize heart rhythm, and have a number of other beneficial roles as well. So one thing to take into consideration is to consume fat to a level that works for you. I think with all these things, you could argue one thing with the other, but ultimately I think the key is about moderation. And it's an individual thing. It's no good going out there and copying somebody else because each individual is unique to themselves. We're all genetically different and different food responds differently to people as well. So we've got to bear that in mind as well. Bad fats is saturated fats. They're generally found in meat and poultry in dairy products like cream, butter, whole milk. Now, eating a diet high in saturated fats can cause your levels of cholesterol to build up. Although, that said and done, as I said earlier, not all saturated fat is bad. Moderation again. Bearing in mind, let's say, a coconut. Coconut, as a saturated fat, one of the highest of the saturated fats there is, 90% of the coconut oil consists of saturated fats, yet its unique combination of fatty acids can have profound positive effects on health. It eases digestion, to name a few things, supports immunity, it helps with metabolism, and it cooks in high temperatures as well. 
Trans fats are void by the bubonic plague if possible. They're not great at all. And they're found in margarines, in donuts, in french fries, in processed foods such as crackers, cookies. They're made from unsaturated fats. They're chemically altered to prolong the shelf life of packaged foods. Trans fats raise bad cholesterol and cause a number of problems like inflammation throughout the body. So moderate your trans fat if possible. Foods high in saturated fats, to name a few, include fatty cuts of meats, meat products, including sausages, pies, butter, ghee, lard, cheese, especially hard cheese, cream, sour cream, ice cream, some savouries as well, chocolate, confectory, biscuits, cakes, pastries. Eating unsaturated fats instead of saturated fats is always a good idea. It can help blood, it can help lower blood cholesterol. Unsaturated fats, that's omega-3 essential fatty acids, you can find them in oily fish, such as salmon, sardines, mackerel, nuts, seeds, sunflower, and olive oil. Unsaturated fats are also found in fruit and vegetables, such as avocados as well. So use food as your friend. Use food, you use food to keep you healthy, to keep you balanced. It can have a mental effect as well too. We didn't go into detail because of time. The mental effect of having a lot of saturated fat can cause as well. So use food as a source of energy. It's changing our relationship to food and seeing food as a source of energy and also a source of well-being as well. Balance your intake. Eating too much fat can also make us put on weight because fat uh, food that is high in fat is very high in energy and calories as well. So whether it's saturated or unsaturated, it's still fat, so we still want to moderate our intake. Like all things, it's balance and moderation. Tips. Cut out processed foods. Avoid cheap vegetable oil. Not good at all. Limit consumption of saturated animal fats. Choose fish wisely as well. Some are farmed with industrial chemicals, some are farmed in areas where there's industrial chemicals. Things like salmon and herring are generally pretty good for you. If you don't eat meat or fish, you can have krill oil. I have krill oil, I have a spoonful every day. It doesn't taste very good, but it does a lot of good for us. Nuts and seeds, avocado, and coconut oil. I mentioned only coconut oil, this is saturated fat, but it's a balancing act. It has a lot of good things that it does for us as well. I suppose it's about knowing your body as well. Know what works for you. If you have coconut oil and you cook with coconut oil, it doesn't work for you, don't use it anymore. And that said, if you have more than, say, two or three teaspoons a day, maybe even too much. So it's all about balance, really, and knowing yourself, knowing what works for you as well. Bad sugars versus good sugars. And you might be thinking, well, all sugar is sugar. Well, you are right to the point, all sugar is sugar. Yet, in saying that, there's processed and natural sugar. Processed sugar can be a disaster and cause a lot of health problems we're going to touch on uh, shortly. Yet, natural sugar, which comes from fruits, can go a long way towards, or fruit goes a long way to providing us a lot of nutrients and health benefits as well. That said, sugar is sugar, wherever it's come from, to a certain extent, and it still has the same amount of calories, we still still moderate it. Yet, that said, there's been this misconception about fruit having a lot of sugar, cut out on fruit. I personally don't buy into it. I think fruit has so many minerals, so many nutrients, so many amino acids, that it's one of the things, again, it's about moderation, uh, which is key. Glycemic index is how quickly each food affects your blood glucose levels when the food's eaten. Now, Foods that are high in GI, sugar, white bread, potatoes, white rice. And one of the problems with food that's high in GI, it rises your blood sugar level and then you come all the way back down again. And in doing that, you're consistently hungry all the time and you find yourself snacking. That's why processed food, you never quite seem to be full. You might feel full afterwards and feel ill after you've eaten it, yet in an hour or so you feel like eating more. Foods that are low to medium glycemic index, well fruit generally is low to medium in glycemic index. Uh, low to medium in glycemic index foods are broken down more slowly uh, and, and, and are digested 
um, into the bloodstream over a longer period of time, providing more sustainable energy. They do include some fruits and vegetables, generally not dried fruits. Now, foods that are low in glycemic index, one of the benefits of that is you don't get that spike energy rush, that sugar rush. You get a consistent level of energy. So you're going to avoid snacking, and as well as having the nutrients that they provide as well, you're not going to go out there and feel like grabbing the fridge every five minutes as well. Foods with high GI aren't necessarily unhealthy for you. Not all foods with low GI are healthy for you as well, so it's very mind having that balance as well. For example, a watermelon. Parsnips are very high in GI, or they're high in GI, and chocolate cake has a lot of GI value in some respects to watermelon. That said, watermelon has a lot of nutritional benefits. It has a lot of nutritional benefits, it has amino acids, has enzymes, it will do you more good if nothing else. Yet chocolate cake is very dense in nutritional values. It has hardly, if anything, any nutrition. So, like all things, it's about moderation. If you're going to eat 20 watermelons a day, then it's probably not going to be very good for you. Yet, in saying that, if a slice of watermelon in a day, then I'm sure you'll be fine. You'll get a lot of health benefits from it as well, which is key. So, as I mentioned earlier, watermelon provides a lot of vitamins, antioxidants as well, and it's low in calories too as well. So it's getting the balance. I think what's really important is getting the balance in, in, all, in all that we eat. I, and I think one of the reasons why I don't really buy into diets is that, generally speaking, they're not very well balanced. They're very extreme. So I think what's really important is making sure that you get a balance. One of the things to bear in mind too is that all foods, like food, and when you combine certain types of food, they have certain types of reactions as well. If you ate foods that were only low in GI, then you might unbalance um, your chemical reactions to food. If you have high foods that were very high in GI, then you're going to be up and down as well. It's going to affect you not just physically, but mentally as well, because you want to have sustained energy throughout the course of the day. So I think one of the key things is really is getting that balance. And in terms of weight loss and, and GI glycemic index, avoiding packaged, processed foods, soda, things that come in packages, you know, things that you get in your dried fruits, things that don't do any, any, any good whatsoever. They spike your blood sugar and your pancreas releases the uh, insulin to bring it back down again. You get this hunger craving all the time. So definitely I would minimize your foods that are high in GI. Yet in saying that, it's about getting a balance. You have to radically look at your chart. You know, you get people, you ever seen sort of people who they walk through the, the, the shop and they kind of look at their chart, that's got this, that's got that, they're reading every label, that sort of stuff. You really don't want to get to that point where if you're advising someone as a coach or nutritionist, they're having to look at everything that they, they eat, or yourself personally. The stress that's going to probably put you under is going to cause you more problems than the actual food itself, really. Getting that balance is key and using that a level of common sense as well. Low GI, for example, on apple, I mentioned earlier, this misconception about fruit not being good for us, fruit not being good for us because it has um, sugar, there's been a lot of people talking about that sort of stuff. Now, let's look at an apple, for example. An apple is low GI, or even low GI, and by eating an apple and having that low GI, sugar's released at a steady pace, and we consistently have energy. But not only that too, an apple, for example, has loads of vitamins, minerals, enzymes, antioxidants, and fiber, which is all necessary for bodily functions and for our well-being. It's generally chemically derived processed sugar that causes a lot of problems. Refined sugars in small amounts won't do any harm if you like to have the other cup of coffee or tea. I'm sure you'll be fine. It's just when we do things excessively over a period of time, that's when we start causing ourselves problems. Things like obesity. And, and, and tooth decay. And also processed sugar has been attributed to things like diabetes type 2 as well too. So fruit versus junk food, just to give you an idea um, and to sort of clarify how beneficial fruit can be, a quarter pound of onion meal has about 1330 calories, 11 grams of fiber. Two bananas have about the same amount of fiber, about 400 calories as well. So it's pretty powerful stuff when you look at 1,330 calories for a quarter pound of onion meal, you're going to get the same fibre from two smallish bananas and they're only 400 calories. And bear in mind that 3,500 calories equates to one pound. So a lot of junk food with a lot of calories doesn't really give you a great deal of fibre or any other nutritional needs as well too. Now, guess how many apples you could eat which would contain 1,330 calories? Have a guess, write it down. What do you think? So we said a quarter pound of meal has 1330 calories. 
how many apples do you think you need to eat to equal that 1330 calories? How many? 20 apples, roughly 20 apples. How many people eat 20 apples in the course of the day? Well, I could probably juice two or three. I don't know if I could eat 20 apples in the course of the day. But more importantly, and most significantly, is the nutrition you get from the apples as well. It controls your appetite, regulates your blood sugar, and it'll make sure that you won't be as hungry as you would be because you're getting the nutrition you need from the food. So the moral of the story is that fruit is good for us. One thing to take into consideration is, like all things, it's moderation and making sure we eat a variety of different fruits and vegetables that provides a variety of different minerals, amino acids, antioxidants, and all the other nutritional values that fruit provides. But one of the views about that, 20 apples has 1330 calories, roughly, if you would take a few calories here and there, Think of fruit in, fruit in general, it's very low in calories. You get so much nutrition out of it as well. So a balanced diet with fruit and vegetables is amazing because you can sustain your appetite, you're getting so much nutrition, you feel a lot better, you're not eating as much as you would generally eat by eating junk food. And what happens is you start to lose weight healthfully and safely. That's me. That's me after doing a series of seminars in London a few years ago. And the reason I show you this picture is that sometimes knowing isn't always enough. I was doing so many seminars in London or around the country, and this was one evening I managed to put on or get to about, say, 100 kilos, and it just crept up on me. It can happen to anybody. I was an athlete, and I also was a conditioning coach in football, and I was active all the time. When I stopped working as a conditioning coach in football and retired from being an athlete, I carried on consuming the same amount of foods, not realizing that bit by bit, you put on weight, don't you? You don't put that weight on, you go to bed at night, you wake up in the morning and you're overweight, it gradually creeps up on you. And I remember myself, I was in London a few years ago, doing some seminars, and I thought, this has got to stop. I'm staying in hotel rooms in the evening, eating food, because the, the, the convenience of, of buying certain foods different times, uh, I'm eating more than I need to eat as well. So it can happen to anybody. And it's about taking control and making some changes in your life. I made changes in my life. I've been there before. If you're in a situation now where you're overweight, I've been there before. I know what it's like. It's just breaking that spiral. I've worked with people a number of years and helped them to get into good shape as well. It's about using a holistic process, mental and eating well, psychological as well, and eating all. So what do you eat? A few tips. Well, limit your processed foods. Sugar and junk is a good place to start. Eat more fruits and greens, very important as well, with high nutritional values. Green, go green. The greener the fruit, or the greener the, the vegetable, the better it is. And we'll talk about that in, 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 in another seminar some other time. Um, replace things like Coca-Cola with water, a bit of lemon as well. I like to get alkaline water with some lemon juice in there and drink it brings your alkaline levels up, fantastic. Replace that bacon sandwich with fruit and vegetable, that bacon sandwich with saturated fats that's not providing you very, very, certainly providing you very, very minimal, if any, nutritional values. Have that fruit or vegetable, have a fruit salad, a bit of yogurt as well, so much nutrition, so many vegetables, so many, so, well, good, so, so many beneficial things that it has. You'll feel better psychologically. You'll be less hungry. You'll feel better. You won't feel, you know, stodgy. It's amazing how much better you'll feel in a short space of time. Replace that chocolate bar with fruit as well. You know, replace that chocolate bar. I'm not saying completely radical and, and get rid of everything. I'm just saying that depending on the situation you're in, if you work as a coach, a nutritionist, depending on the situation your client's in, changes are important. Changes are key. If you carry on doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting the same results. Fruit and vegetables. Fruit and vegetables are essential. And, and make sure you have a variety of colours in your fruit and vegetables. Have your broccoli, your peppers, your orange, your grape, your blueberries, some bananas. Get a variety, because without moderation. You wouldn't want to get through the day eating 20 apples. How about some broccoli? How about some pepper? How about some onion? Some cucumbers? And you could juice as well. One of the things I did to help me lose weight when I gained weight 
is juicing. I'd get up in the morning and make a smoothie. I'd have vegetables, avocado, broccoli. I'd use cucumber, orange, apple. I'd put a bit of flaxseed oil in as well. And fantastic. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even feel like eating until midday when I got to midday. And I would eat some salads with some salmon. You're getting a little bit of a balance really, um, which is key. But having a variety of vegetables and fruit as well will do you all good. Other tips, high fiber foods, drink water, at least eight glasses a day. Uh, the greener the better, high alkaline in terms of vegetables. Portion sizes too, minimize your portion sizes. I would say eat more regularly than, than big portions. So you might have your smoothie in the morning at, at seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Then at 10 o'clock in the morning, you might have an apple, then at midday you might have some salmon with salad. So then in the evening or in the afternoon you might have a snack and have a fruit. In the evening you might have some quinoa uh, with some salmon or, or, or some chicken. Whatever really, but minimize your portion. Make your portion smaller. Um, also, if you can, if it's possible, eat organic as well. Don't eat late at night as well, because calories stored you're not going to burn them anyway, so the later you're in at night, this is going to store themselves in, in, and they're going to turn into fat. I'm going to burn any of those calories, or well, not all of them anyway, and also it's going to cause a strain in the digestive system too, and it's going to interrupt your sleep pattern. So I wouldn't recommend you late at night. As a ballpark figure, I would say after 8, 9 o'clock in the evening, I, I, I wouldn't eat personally. Yes, if you go to bed at 10 o'clock in the evening, 11 o'clock in the evening. So, so maybe three to four hours before you go to bed is, is the last time you eat, so it's a good. Uh, ballpark figure as well. Other tips, limit sweets as well. Avoid soft drinks. They have a lot of artificial ingredients. Um, junk food, minimize that. Don't buy it in, if possible. One thing to think about is maybe go out and treat yourself once a week. Go out to a restaurant, enjoy yourself, let yourself go. You have the 80 20 rule. If you bring it in, the temptation to go out there and eat it is going to be too tempting. So I would say just go out there. And, and, and enjoy yourself once a week. It's the only 20. Life is short. What the heck? If you like going out and, and treating yourself, why not once a week? At least you can focus and look forward to doing that, and throughout the week you can be very, very disciplined. Useful tools you can use, which is very, very powerful stuff, is a food diary, a thought diary as well. And the reason being is that the amount of people I've worked with over a, a, a long period of time who are adamant that they are eating well. They're adamant, I'm eating fine, it's my metabolism, it's my genetics, I'm born that way. And it's not until they write down in their food diary what they've been eating throughout the week, they begin to realize, actually, you know what? I am eating more than I need to eat. And it's not always the main meals that are the worst that we eat. Generally speaking, when we write down in our food diary, we begin to realize it's that snacking, it's that chocolate bar after we've had our lunch, it's that ice cream we had before we go to bed, and bear in mind that the way things work, I mentioned earlier before, um, calories that we don't burn turn to fat. Nobody wakes up in the morning um, and is overweight, it takes a period of time. You might even put a pound on a month. And over three years, you're you know, 30, 40 pounds heavier than what you were before. That's what happened to me without realizing it. It's just a gradual process. You might think, well, actually, no, I'll treat myself this, that, and the other. A diary is your evidence in terms of what you eat. And I would go so far to say, you know who I've worked with a long period of time who are adamant that eating well, when I do a food diary, begin to realize, actually, you know what? They're eating a lot more than they need to. And that's where you can sort of identify certain foods that aren't doing you all the good. And you can start eliminating certain foods that are dead in calories, high in calories, but not offering any nutritional values. So I would go so far is having a food diary, if you're looking to lose weight yourself, or you're coaching somebody else, Keep that food diary, it's really important. A thought diary is important as well. How you feel when you're eating food. The relationship between food and our mind as well. I'm gonna sort of touch on that briefly tonight. Having a thought diary, sometimes we eat for emotional reasons. You might have an argument at work or with your partner and you might decide, well actually, you know, as a comfort food. And you can identify what you could do different rather than eat. So you might, for example, be stressed at work and you might, through your stress, have, you know, go down to the local coffee store and buy yourself one of those big mochaccinos and, and big cookie as a comfort food. You might think, well, actually, you know what? I'm stressed at work, I can identify that trigger, and I have felt emotionally, I'll just go for a walk. And having gone for a walk, I'll relax, bring my heart rate down, 
and, and compose myself again. So a thought diary can be a very useful tool to see how you felt emotionally when you ate certain types of food because our relationship psychologically with food goes a long way to helping us change. I'm just going to touch on briefly different types of eaters, which is quite an interesting area. There are different types of eaters. Behaviour has an impact where it is concerned. You've got your emotional eaters. People who eat and their eating is fueled by emotion. Now, one way to look at that, and I'm going to give you an example of that. Many years ago, I was with a client, and she was a very high powered businesswoman, fantastically well in major business, done very well for herself. She had an issue with weight, she was three or four stone overweight, she couldn't seem to lose the weight, and that's the typical person who said to me, she was eating really, really well. This is a food diary. We see that every day when she gets home, she eats two chocolate bars. Every time she gets home from work, two chocolate bars and a cup of coffee. And we identified that as being a problem where her weight was concerned. Because at the time, the chocolate bar is about 400 calories each one, two, that's about 1,000 calories. In the space of a week, that's 7,000 calories. That's two pounds extra if we're not burning it off that we're putting on. So in time, it's going to cause us to gain weight. And when we recognize that and say, well, if we could change that, everything else pretty much balances itself out with a few changes here and there. But that's causing 80-90% of the problem. We've got to eliminate that or change that. And when we explored and looked at things a little bit more deeper, I done a process called regression, it's a hypnotherapy process, the hypnotherapists that are watching or know what it's all about, but I regressed it back in time. And when I regressed her, we found that she had an emotional relationship with that chocolate bar. When she was very young, whenever she had any issue or she hurt herself physically or had a problem at school, she'd go home and what would her mum do? She'd give her a chocolate bar. And she had a relationship with chocolate and love. So it was her way, she was living on her own as well, so it was her way to compensate for that loneliness. Eating that chocolate bar had an association to feeling love. We had to remove that association. She had to find other ways to have that feeling of love because as long as she was eating chocolate bar every day or two of them when she came to work, she wasn't going to lose that weight. She was going to gain more weight, which is not the outcome that she wanted. So emotionally eaters, take that in mind that some people eat, it's emotionally fueled. We've got conditioned eaters. You go back to your uh, teenage years and you want to go out and play or go out or whatever and your parents say hey there's people in some part of the world that would do anything to eat that meal because you want to leave a little bit of meal to, to one you want to leave half your meal or a little bit of your meal um, to, to leave the table we've got our conditioning eaters we're conditioned eaters we feel guilty if we leave a little bit of a portion on our plate anyone like that anyone, that's a reason for anybody Put your hand up if you're a conditioned eater, where you feel guilty if you leave a few grains of rice on your plate. And that's conditioned eating as well. Conditioned eating also can be our association with the media as well, these advertisements that we see as well, our association to, you get these chocolate bars that work, rest and play, and they have all these positive associations as well too. That can be classed as conditioned eating as well too. It's about breaking that association as well and seeing it for what it is and take control of yourself as well. Subconscious eaters have gone to the pictures and just scoffed the whole um, bag of popcorn without even realizing it. Subconscious eaters, you always tend to have food every time you grab it. You go to the fridge and then realize that you have a couple of chocolates, you sit down, you have a cup of coffee, you go back in the fridge. We all know that part as well. Literally you drive through the drive through and you buy yourself a big uh, one of those big uh, super sized meals and you eat it without realizing it. It's about consciously making a decision. Actually, I'm going to change my dietary habits. I'm going to change what I eat. Take control of my subconscious mind as well, which is key. So I've sort of just scratched the surface here with behavior and eating. But the reason for scratching the surface is that it is important. A lot of nutritionists out there, they try and help people just on a conscious level. And they don't realize that it's not always as easy as that. Certain things run pretty deep. And sometimes it goes a long way. I'm not saying if you're a nutritionist, go out there and, and be a therapist too. But sometimes without having a good network of people. 
as a nutritionist, you might want to have someone who's a good therapist and, and vice versa to help each other, um, which is key. Because no matter how good you are as a nutritionist, you give people all the best advice you want to, other people know what they should and shouldn't eat to a certain degree. If psychologically they're not in the right place, then it's going to be a bit of a challenge as well. So the key is, I would always say, have a network of people that you can refer people on to. Or maybe learn a bit yourself in different areas, so you can at least be aware, if nothing else, the problems that people might face in certain situations. Goals are important. Setting goals, set goals, you know, use the SMART goal principle, we haven't heard it before, it's an acronym, be very specific about what you want, weight wise, is it measurable, how would you measure it? The more specific you are, the better. So be specific about what weight size you want to be, what suit size, what dress size, the more specific you are, the better. Years ago, when I was doing a program on BBC Radio Manchester, there was this woman, she was in the 60s, she was looking to lose a little bit of weight, and they asked if I could take her on board and use some psychological skills and physical training and nutrition to get her to optimum weight. As it happens, in the first session, I said, okay, let's set some goals. Let's be very specific about what you're going to be. It was probably two stars she wanted to lose. Um, she wanted to achieve a few other things as well that I'm going to talk about briefly. Now, ultimately, by setting those goals, we gave her a sense of purpose and something to aim for. Something for the mind to aim for. I think it's really important to set goals, um, which is key. Albeit, as far as I'm aware, she said to me before we set goals that her doctor said, I believe, if I remember correctly, she has some thyroid condition, and the doctor said it wasn't, might not be possible to lose weight, or so she said anyway. I said, well, you know what? We'll give it a shot. Nothing mentioned, nothing gained. Who knows? Let's give it a shot and see what happens. Medical people are always right. I'm not a medical professional myself, so I can't comment on that. But you know what? The mind works in mysterious ways. The world works in mysterious ways. Who knows? Sometimes we set a target, we might achieve it. We'll give it a goal. So we set a goal with Margaret. We set a goal of what weight she wanted to be. Um, specifically, she says what weight she wanted to be, what, what dress size she wanted to get into. Was it measurable? Yeah, it was. We could, uh, yeah, along the way, there's some different milestones of her getting to where she wanted to get to. Was it achievable? Well, it was, because she'd been that way many, many years earlier, but she had been that way, so it was achievable. Um, was it realistic? Well, it was, really, because it was two, two and a half stone in, in, say, four or five months. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and time-wise, four, five, six months, yeah, the time was good as well. And it was pretty amazing, really, because just by setting those goals and taking time to sit down and constantly set goals, four or five months later, Margaret did lose the weight, which was fantastic. Not only that, her quality of life changed. She was eating better, she was psychologically in a better place, she booked a holiday to go to Spain for the first time in many years, and was socialising. So many things. She would got running for the first time in, uh, I think it was 20 years, she was saying, because she just had a free knees. So many things happened. And after that as well, she had a kind of fear or phobia of swimming that she had since eight years of age. Incredible. She said she wanted to go back to me again because it would help her socialise with her friends again. And it was quite amazing really that as a result of setting goals, we did what we call timeline or regression for the NLP, the favorite people, you'll be aware of that. And we used to help overcome the fear of phobia of swimming as well. So it starts with a vision. And I truly believe combining psychological strategies as well with nutrition and, and using a holistic process goes a long way to helping people achieve their goals, uh, which is key. I think more importantly, you know, be grateful for who we are. You know, don't wait for that day in your life where you're that perfect way to enjoy life. Go out and enjoy life now. And, and tell your clients as well, they come and see if you're a coach, a nutritionist, you know, tell your clients to, you know, enjoy yourself. Be happy, be positive, be grateful, write a gratitude list of all things you can be grateful for. Don't wait to get to that perfect way to be happy and start enjoying life. Make that transition. What I always say to people, Connect to what it would be like emotionally to be your ideal way. What would you see, hear, and feel? Make it really compelling. I get my clients to close their eyes and visualize and think about what it's like to be the perfect way. What would they hear, what they see, what they feel? By connecting to it emotionally, more driven to get to what we want to get to, uh, which, is, which is key. So enjoyment is the key and enjoy the process because 
You don't want it to be a chore. You don't want exercise to be a chore. You don't want eating or diets to be a chore. You want to be able to enjoy yourself. And there are a lot of recipes out there you can use and planning and a lot of things you can do. It really is a lifestyle change. And once you make that lifestyle change, or your clients, if you're a coach, or your nutritionist make a lifestyle change, you won't look back. Anybody who gets themselves in a situation and feel better, they're active, they're going for walks, they're going salsa dancing, they're playing badminton with friends and family, they do all things they want to do, they eat well, they've got more energy, they've got more nutrition, they feel a lot better, they're very unlikely to go back to where they were before. And it's a knock on effect. It's not just about you if you lose weight, it's also about the people around you as well. Think of the impact it has on your children, your professional colleagues, your family, your wife, your husband, by feeling better and getting in the best shape ever as well. It has a massive impact as well. I'd like to thank you for tuning in this evening. I've really enjoyed delivering the seminar. If you want any more information on anything we've covered tonight, feel free to email us at the centre on info at xlvnlp.com. Uh, That's info at xlvnlp.com. So feel free to email me for anything that we covered tonight or anything that you want to sort of cover in more detail. We've got plenty of tutorials available. We've got plenty of resources, plenty of Word, documents, PDFs, whatever you need. Do email if you want to follow anything up that we've covered tonight. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in. Have a fantastic evening and enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Good night.